Father, I thank you that you've got us. Lord, you've got every single one of our lives, and, and what an incredible <coughs> God you are to be able to move and do what is right in each one of us. And Lord, we praise you that your grace is not just sufficient, Lord. It is more than enough. It is all we need. May it be all we want, Lord. So uh, work in our lives. Teach us tonight. May we uh, not only say we believe these truths, but may we glory in them as Paul did. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, because of the importance of the topic, we're only going to cover the first 10 verses of chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians. So if you would open up your Bibles and, and stand, then let's read those first 10 verses together. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 10. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know, God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven, and I know such a man. And whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one, I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be, or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might not depart from me, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Seated. Last time we, go ahead and sit down. <laughs> Last time we, we met, we looked at 1 Corinthians, and we saw that the church was in dire need of being corrected in a lot of areas. And so we find Paul taking on that role, as, as God had called him to do, to make those corrections, to exhort them and rebuke them. But the church was hesitant to receive from Paul, kind of questioning his authority, like, what right do you have to talk to us like this? You know, you're not an apostle. So they're, they're questioning him. And I remember uh, years ago when we were at Costa Mesa, I was in charge of this uh, group of ladies, and, and they tended to have a lot of inner conflict. And I had come here, and I'd been here for about a year, but I went someplace where these ladies were in charge of some things, and, and they were doing this inner conflict thing again. And I went over to them, and I sat them down, and I really, I was like, you cannot do this, and really rebuked them. Well, I remember one of the ladies was new to the group and didn't know me, and she stopped, and she goes, excuse me, who are you? You know, it's like, what right do you have and to talk to us like this? And, and so, you know, the, the rest of the ladies knew I loved them very much, and they gave me that right. And, and, and so the church in Corinth is kind of questioning Paul, like, who are you to talk to us like this? And so he's been put in a position of pulling out his heavy ammunition. His accusers claimed, you're not an apostle. One of the signs of apostleship is that they, they had the right to be supported by the church. Paul chose not to do that. And so since he refused his support, they were claiming, see, Paul even knows he's not an apostle. If he was, he would have taken support. And another sign of apostleship or God's calling was visions and revelations. Not that if you had visions and revelations, uh, you were an apostle, but rather if you hadn't had any they assumed you were not. So 
A vision is something you see. God's showing you something. So a vision is always seen either with your eyes or with your mind. Now, revelation is more general. It's something God shows a person. It can be seen and, or heard or, or simply recognized in the mind or the heart. It's the communication of the knowledge of God to the spirit, an expression of the mind of God for instructing us or edifying us, either personally or edifying the church, insight into a spiritual truth. Now, that's important. Insight into a spiritual truth. See, do you like that? See, that means each one of us as believers, we've had at least one revelation. I think you're sitting in here and you know you've had more than that. Our first probably being the understanding of, of Jesus that we never had before. See, that's God revealing Jesus to us. God revealing his need. How many times have you read the word and he's opened up some understanding to you? That's a revelation. And so we get to say, oh, I've had revelations. God has shown me things that I would not have known outside of his spirit. So in Paul's efforts to convince the Corinthians that his teaching was worthy of being heeded, he writes in the first verse, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Paul had had several. He often spoke of his Damascus Road experience, but as far as we know, what he shared in this chapter of 2 Corinthians had never been shared. And it happened 14 years before this writing. Think about what that would have been like for Paul to kind of be forced to come to the place of sharing about this. And I think in a lot of ways it, it saddened him that he had to kind of pull this out to convince the people of his authority then I thought, what a turmoil it must have been because how badly he must have wanted to, to say, I've seen heaven through those 14 years to, to tell somebody it's real. But see, that's not the means by which God uses to save people. You know, we think, oh, talking about a great revelation, that's going to, to cause people to come to the Lord. But see, those kind of things appeal to the mind. What appeals to the spirit is what? The gospel. So God says to you and to me, talk about the gospel. That's what's going to change lives and save souls. So, but this was his trump card, and he didn't want to play it. It was his revelation. It was for him and nobody else. Verse 4 even tells us that he was not allowed to share what he heard and to prevent him from being prideful and boasting about it, he was given a thorn in the flesh, which apparently was very painful. Now, if God afflicted you to prevent you from boasting in a prideful way about something, wouldn't you really, really think about it before you told someone else? Think of the position he was in. I mean, the thorn was given to him to prevent him from being prideful. What might God do if Paul acted out on it and was prideful. So for 14 years, Paul remained silent. But now, not to gain glory for himself, that was too risky. But because he loved these believers in Corinth, Paul chose to share, still honoring the Lord's command not to share what he saw, to share a revelation unlike any that those who opposed him could have claimed to have. Paul had an incredible love and burden for those within his sphere of ministry. He, he felt responsible for them. Listen to what the, the Jews, he said about the Jews in Romans 9, 3. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. That's love. In other words, if I could save them, I'd be willing to go to hell. That's a, such a love for the people. And this is the love that Paul had for these people in Corinth. And I can't help but think Paul was saddened to have come to the point where he had to share this experience. But he found it necessary for the sake of the believers in Corinth because he knew his correction was necessary for their good. And so he shared this, and I just want to read it from NIV for a little variety. 
I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things that man is not permitted to tell. That's it. 14 years ago. That puts Paul in his early ministry, before his first missionary journey, about five years after he was saved. There's a lot of speculation as to um, when this happened and how it might have happened, but it's just speculation. We just don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. Luke didn't share about it in Acts because he didn't know anything about it, I'm guessing. It doesn't look like Paul told him. Paul doesn't share much about this incredible experience. I mean, imagine how hard it must have been for him to hear the sounds of heaven and not share it with anybody. I, I think of the times that the Lord has shown me something. And I can't wait to tell Dale. You know, I was reading my devos and, and the Lord showed me this, you know, so exciting. And then to think that he saw and heard heaven and the Lord says, you can't talk about it. That must have been really something, but he was obedient. And he's not sure if he was in the body or not. It doesn't seem to matter. If he was out of the body, he didn't seem to miss it. See, when we are in heaven, our earthly bodies will no longer be the source of our thinking or our feeling like they are now. See, we, we hate that term brain dead, but brain dead only refers to our earthly experience. It means our body's no, look, no longer looking to itself for its consciousness. Consciousness has moved on. That's all brain dead is. And Paul didn't know whether he was in his body or not. It's amazing how many commentators try to answer what, what Paul could not. Paul didn't know, and we don't know. He tells us he was caught up into the third heaven. Now, caught up is the very same word that we use as rapture. You know, it's a, it's a sudden catching up. He was translated, beamed up, if you would, into the third heaven. And now, the first heaven, that's the clouds, the air, the, and the second heaven are the stars and the sky. Third heaven is what we think of as heaven Ephesians 4.10 and NIV says, He who descended, speaking of Jesus, is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So the third heaven is the highest of heavens, higher than any heaven that natural man could travel to. And there in that third heaven, there in paradise, Paul heard inexpressible words, words too sacred or too holy to be uttered, secrets that you and I one day will get to see as Paul did and hear as Paul did. Heaven's going to be an incredible place. It's not going to be like life on earth, but without sadness or, or sickness, it will be glorious. And Paul heard words in heaven, too good, too spiritual, too beyond us, and our little human thinking to be uttered. I mean, think about it, in your highest imagination, what could Paul have heard that was that wonderful that you and I could understand right now? He heard things beyond us, too wonderful for us to understand with these infinite or these finite minds of ours. He heard things so wonderful, they probably sustained him through the toughest of times. But to repeat them, to talk about them, he could not... Not that he was not able, but he was not allowed. As much as God revealed to Paul throughout his life and Paul passed on to us, as much as you and I have learned about Jesus from Paul, what Paul learned when he was caught up into paradise was not for you and it was not for me. It was just for Paul, just for Paul. Now, remember, God's not a respecter of persons. No one's more special than another. But he equips us to perform the callings that we have in our lives. And Paul was called to much, wasn't he? 
In Acts 19, after his experience on the Damascus Road, the Lord appeared to Ananias and told him to go to the house of Judas and find Paul. That Paul had been given a, vin a vision, and the vision included Ananias coming to him. And Ananias' answer to the Lord was, I have heard many things about this man. How much harm has he done? He has done to your saints in Jerusalem. This guy's scary. And God's answer? But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. That's an unusual thing. I mean, when you came to the Lord, did, did the Lord say, you know, here it is. These are the things you're going to suffer. We had no idea what, what it was out ahead and what it still is out ahead for us. But he showed Paul for his name's sake. Jesus showed Paul, Saul or Paul right in the very beginning of his ministry, how many things he would suffer for his sake. And before Paul went on his missionary journeys, on which much of that suffering took place, Paul was caught up into the third heaven and heard inexpressible words. It would seem that to suffer as Paul did for the name of Jesus, he would need some extraordinary experience to strengthen him. As someone in ministry, I, I often forget that, that God just wants to show me something. You know, as a teacher, I find myself, anything that happens in life, anything the Lord shows me right away, I'm thinking, what message might I, I put that in? What, what person might I be able to use this and minister to them? And I often think he just shows me things so, so I can show you. And I'm never... I never cease to be amazed when he quickens something to me and, and then he'll say, this is just for you. This is because you need this. And I'm like, me? You know, you're just showing me? And he did this for Paul. He just showed Paul because God in his mercy and his knowledge of what Paul needed to accomplish, what God had called him to do, took him up into heaven and showed him a peace of what he could, what was waiting for him in eternity. See, you and I don't need that, or God would do that for us. We have not been called to suffer the extent that Paul did. What suffering we are called to do, he has given us grace sufficient to endure it, as we will see in the next few verses. So Paul reminded them in verse 6 that he was not, foolishly boasting, but he's telling the truth. And then he wrote, but I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. Paul realized if he boasted in the wrong way, it would, would not only be bad for him, but it would be bad for them. As boasting might cause Paul to, to think of himself better than he was, that boasting might also have that same effect on them. I mean, isn't that often our goal in life, for, for people to think better of us than we are? You know, we, we, we think of things to tell people, oh, so they'll think I'm great. And you know you're not. So you want them to think better of you than you know you are. And, and he thought that. Um, last week I was reading in, in Ecclesiastes and Solomon's observations and conclusions about life. And, and, and he said this towards the end of the book. And moreover because the preacher, talking about himself, was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. And it hit me, I thought, but there was a time in your life, Solomon, that you were not wise as a result of marrying foreign wives and worshiping their gods. Solomon lost perspective and he lost godly wisdom. And I was thinking, I wonder if he ever noticed because if you've read Ecclesiastes, don't you read some of those things and go, oh, Solomon, what happened to your godly wisdom? That's not a wise statement. I, he, he, his observations were correct, but his conclusions were not wise many times in Ecclesiastes. And, and I started thinking, did you even see when wisdom left you? 
Are you like Samson who didn't realize when the strength had left him? Solomon was known throughout the world for his wisdom. And I thought, did he feel this pressure to maintain his reputation? Ever been like that? You know, people think you're godly and, and, and your walk isn't that good, so now you're going to pretend? And I think that was where I was at. But Paul, he fought that. He didn't want people to think highly of him. He wanted people to think highly of God. But their dim view of him limited their reception of the truth. Paul taught about the Lord, and Paul wasn't about to have that. Remember the effect of seeing Peter and John do miracles in the book of Acts? The people were so impressed with Peter and John that they, they worshiped them rather than the Lord. And Paul was so intent that they focus on and receive his teachings, not think of him as a super saint. Paul did not want them to exalt him beyond measure, beyond who he was. Remember who Paul said he was? I, I'm the chief of sinners. And he did not want, and God didn't want Paul to exalt himself beyond measure, to get puffed up, to think he was better than, than someone else because he received a revelation that was better than others had ever received. So as verse seven says, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. Notice plural, it wasn't just one. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a message of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. And Paul began and ended this verse with the same phrase, lest I be exalted above measure. Paul knew spiritual gifts were not a sign of God's approval on a person. He wrote in Romans 12, 3, New International, for the, by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. You see how important this is to Paul? But rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. So the reason for the thorn is very clear, to keep Paul from pride. See, there's lots of reasons for thorns. And very often, probably most of the time, we want to know why. Why is this thorn given to me? Why is something happening to us? Our church has gone through a lot of losses in this past year. And for some reason, it's been the women, not the men. But some taken in old age, Others seemingly afflicted before their time, at least from our perspective. And we know God has a purpose in all he does, so it's, it's hard not to wonder. Has, has what happened to some of these that we know are so godly is because of their surrender to the Lord? Is this what God does when we say, take my life? Does he bring or allow more affliction because we tell him that he can? Surrender is a battle term. It implies giving up all rights to the conqueror. And when an opposing army surrenders, they, they lay down their arms and the winners take control from then on. And, and too often we see that as what, what God does. But see, our conqueror that we have surrendered to, he's a good, good God. And surrendering to, to God, God has a plan for our lives and surrendering to him means we set aside our own plans and we eagerly seek his. See, the good news is his plan for us is in our best interest. We don't see that in, in war times with the conquerors. He promised in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And, and surrender just enables him to do those things in our life that are good for us. Our plans, there's a way that seems right to a man, but his end is a way of death. And so in surrendering, we're giving our lives to the God who will do best with them. I have a very, very strong faith in the power of God. My faith in God's goodness is every bit as strong and so when we surrender, we are surrendering to a powerful God, but we are always surrendering to a God that always does good. 
I, I always think, you know, when we, we had our kids dedicated to the Lord, I don't know if you thought this, but I remember thinking, I'm doing such a good thing, you know, giving my, my children to the Lord. You know, what a, what a sacrifice. And, and giving our children to the Lord for his use puts them under his care, his loving kindness. It's the best thing that we can do for our children. God hates pride. It's one of the six things that he hates. We talked about that, I think, last time we were together. Proverbs 16.5 says, Everyone proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though they join forces, none of them will go unpunished. Habakkuk 2.4, Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him. The just shall live by faith. First John 2.16, for all that is in the world, the lust of flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So pride is something Satan tries to get us to buy into, to fall prey to. It's contrary to what God would have us be. Pride and faith, they, they combat against one another because Pride tells you to what? Look at your own strength. Faith tells you, look to God's strength. And if pride keeps us from God, then it keeps us from not only knowing him and growing in him, but it keeps us from being used by him. And so our usefulness on this earth is pretty limited. And God's purposes for us are, are thwarted. So to prevent Paul from uh, becoming prideful, a thorn in the flesh was given. Notice it wasn't given for correction or punishment, but for prevention of pride. Paul had done nothing wrong. It wasn't even that he had prideful thoughts. The thorn was given to prevent him from having them. How many thorns have been given to you and to me just to prevent us from doing something stupid? Because God knows us so very well. And we, each one of us, are capable of the very worst of sins. So before you think you are better because you haven't fallen in a particular area, consider that God may have brought something into your life, whether it be a thorn or a circumstance, just to prevent you from doing what you think you are beyond doing. Interesting, isn't it? I mean... Wouldn't you think those that had experienced great revelations from the Lord would experience a, a good change in their flesh, you know, a humility, maybe more spirituality? But this is an example that says to us, not so. Very often the reaction that we have when God reveals something to us is not humility, it's pride. And Paul had to be dealt with to prevent him from letting his flesh get the best of him. A thorn was given. Not a little splinter that might get stuck in your fingertip. If it was, Paul could have just pulled it out himself. Thorn here is better translated as a, a stake, a sharp stake used for torturing or impaling someone. Now, what specifically was this thorn? Again, commentators have tried to decide what, what that was. Some quote Galatians 4, 13 to 15. Paul wrote, you know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. He had some sort of disease in his eyes. It could have been his thorn in the flesh but he also could have been writing about something else. See, personally as a speaker, especially when I, I go out to speak, I know the first at least five minutes of when I, I get up there, I'm being analyzed. You know, what, what's her outfit look like? You know, what, what's her hair look like? Does she smile? You know, all of those kinds of things. I'm very aware and I, I hate that part. Uh, but I'm, but I'm, I'm watching eyes, and they're just trying to figure out, who is this person? I don't know who she is, and why should I listen to her four hours, you know, in a retreat? And, and so, uh, you know, it's just like, what is that about? 
And I think if he had this, this oozing eye disease, that definitely would have kept him from thinking he was some charismatic speaker. He would have been very conscious of that, but we just don't know. But we do know it was something that humbled Paul, and we know it was an ongoing problem. So for 14 years, and apparently until the end of his life, Paul suffered with this thorn. As has been taught many times, we don't know, because really, if we did, we think, oh, you know, Paul had an eye problem. I don't, I don't have an eye problem. This, this whole scripture just applies to this, but we don't know what it was. And so we can apply it to our own situations and our own pain as if the answer to Paul's pain applies to us, because it does. Whatever the thorn was, the people in Corinth probably knew what it was. Ever wonder what the people were saying? Were Paul's accusers, like, like Job's friends, saying, oh, this affliction is a, a punishment from God? Paul sinned, and God's afflicting him to make him pay. Maybe Paul thought that, but he knew better because the Lord showed him. But, I mean, Paul's past was, was full of doing bad things. Surely maybe people were sitting there thinking, that's why this has happened. Or maybe faith teachers jumped at the chance of accusing Paul. The one who God used to heal others can't heal himself. So God gave Paul this thorn, and yet it was a messenger of Satan. How do we know God gave it to Paul? Paul basically says so, but because of its purpose to keep him from being prideful. Satan has no concern to keep you and I from being prideful. Yet God permits Satan to buffet his saints. We see in Job 6 and 7, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Luke 13, 16, the woman that had been afflicted for years, Jesus said, so ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. And then Jesus just simply said, woman, be loosed. And she was set free. God permits even sends Satan, allowing him to afflict us. But that affliction is always, always for our good. See, too often we try to explain the, the why questions. We'll not allow ourselves to think God might be behind something awful. To say that would be to label God as evil, but reality is God hates, absolutely hates sin. But he allows some pretty bad consequences and, and afflictions in our lives. Sometimes it's his direct messenger. Other times it's a result of something. And a lot of times it's just a result that we live in a very, very evil world. But in allowing, he always uses it for good. And I guess Satan will never figure that out. He goes after God's children with gusto. Yet if we seek God, Satan always loses. His intentions for the affliction are always thwarted. And the tables are turned, and the believer is better for the affliction if it had not happened. Still takes a toll, still painful, but we're better for it. See, if that were not true, God would never allow it in the lives of his children A mother would never allow her child to endure the pain of a shot if she knew it wasn't good for them. And, and we have in Matthew 7, 11, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how, know how to do loving things, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? You know what that says to me? If you ask... If it's best for you, God's best, you got it. 
That's his promise. He only does good things, but it's his good, which is so much better than what we think is our good. Now, I don't get that in terms of understanding. I trust that. I believe that. In fact, I, I said to Dale last, last week, I said, I, I think these last three years have been the most painful years of our lives. But you know what? I trust God more than I ever have. And I, I watch us try to explain why God does what he does. I try to find the good in, in something that, that he hasn't really explained. You know, and I find that, that in, in times of sickness and things that, you know, one time we explain the good and why God took someone quickly. And then we try to find that the good and why God let someone linger. And we've got to stop trying to explain him. So you know what? I trust God. God knows what he's doing, whether he takes someone immediately or lets someone go through a lot of pain. God's God. And we don't have to try to explain him away to ourselves or to others. I mean, I've done a lot of thinking and lately, and uh, I've thought a lot about the, the pain that, that I'm exposed to because of the suffering of the people in this church. And you know, then that little voice comes and says, you know, if you get out of ministry, you wouldn't have to suffer any of those pains. Just family pain, you know? Just friend pain, but, but not church pain. You could avoid all of that. But I also would avoid all the joy that I get in, in traveling with you and, and watching God work in your lives. And I wouldn't trade that for anything. I have a few secular songs on my playlist on my phone, and one is Gladys Knight's Midnight Train to Georgia, song of the 60s. It's only you older people that are shaking your, your heads right now. <laughs> but the song's about her boyfriend, her love. You know, he came to L.A., and he tried to make it, and he couldn't make it in L.A., so he was leaving on the midnight train, going back to Georgia. And she had decided she was going to leave the world that, that she loved in L.A., the world that worked for her because she wanted to be with him more. And, and here's the line that got me Sunday as I was driving home from church, and I applied it to the relationship with the Lord. She goes, I'd rather live in his world than live without him in mine. And isn't that true? I'd rather live in his world under, under his care, under his plan for me, and live without him and live according to what I think is the way my life should go. See, Paul figured this out. A messenger of Satan was sent to buffet Paul. And the word buffet is in present tense, indicating it's continuing, just kept on hurting. Buffet is to beat or to strike with a fist. Think of all Paul was called to do and the persecution he suffered in doing it. And now on top of all that, we discover that Paul was constantly plagued by some thorn in the flesh, constantly. Considering all that, see, would you have quit? Aren't you glad Paul didn't quit? Aren't you glad Paul didn't fall prey to those seemingly Christian words that we throw out way too quickly? Well, I guess God closed the door. Are you saying that to the Lord, if I were only stronger... If I didn't have to deal with this, I could serve you. See, Paul didn't say that, but instead he pressed on in spite of it all. And he went through the shipwrecks and the beatings and, and the nakedness and the peril and the sword and all of those things with a thorn in the flesh. He didn't let the thorn in his flesh hinder him or hold him back. He pressed on. And verse 8 says, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Get rid of it, Lord. That was Paul's prayer. Three times. Not, how can you use this in my life, Lord? Not, how can I glorify you in this, Lord? But, Lord, take it away. And I'm glad Paul admitted that, aren't you? Because how many times have you and I been in that place? Lord, just take it away. Two times, no answer. Two times of pleading, serious prayer. 
What do you do when that happens? See, too often we give up. We stop asking and we miss out on the answer. What is happening when it seems like God is not answering our prayers? What does 1 John 5, 14 and 15 say? Now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have asked of him. So pay attention here. What are these verses telling us? That we can know we have what we ask for if we ask according to his will. So if I'm not connecting, what is that saying? My prayers are off. And so I got to keep praying until my, my prayers are right. Not giving up because God may say no. God may, may give you a confidence. As I've been praying for Clorinda, all I'm getting is, is God saying, I've got this. But when God says to you and me, I've got this, that helps, doesn't it? But see, what if we quit and just, oh, Lord, heal Clorinda and, and walk away, but, but don't get that peace. Don't get that comfort that God wants to do in our lives because we quit. But Paul persisted until he got a hold of God's heart for him. The third time Paul prayed, God answered his prayer, not with um, the answer Paul was looking for, but after he accepted God's answer, Paul found out that that was the answer he needed. Now, his request, take this away. God's answer, my grace is sufficient. And Paul was, I like that answer. That answer works for me. That answer is the best answer, Lord. So verse 9 says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I read a, a story about a little girl who asked her Sunday school teacher why Jesus came to his disciples two times in the garden and said, watch and pray. But the third time, he didn't say that. He just said, sleep and take your rest. And the teacher was a little bit befuddled and didn't know what to, to say to her. And before he could come up with some kind of answer, the little girl came up with her own. She said, I think I know. It was because Jesus had seen the face of the, his father and he didn't need their help anymore. And I love that. See, he sought the Lord. And remember, he, he sweated those, those drops of blood. But when he walked out, he was so strong. Now, and, and the soldiers came to get him, and they said, they're looking for Jesus Christ. And what did he say? I am. And they fell over. What power? Don't quit. Keep praying till you get a hold of what God wants to say to you. Out of the mouths of babes. I mean, how many times have you and I thought we had to have our prayers answered in a certain way? And we got a hold of the Lord's hearts and our desires dimmed in the light of his answer. There are two ways of lightening a burden. One is diminishing its actual weight. And the other is increasing the strength of the shoulders that bear it. And God uses both in our lives. We like the first one. But when our lives are all said and done, we will declare our praises to him for all the times he used the second. Jesus' response to Paul's prayers, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. It seems like we often leave the, the second part out. But first, my grace is sufficient. Not will be or should be. It is sufficient. The power or strength to withstand any danger. It is enough. It is able. It's enough for what you need. Jesus told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And I, I love those last two words, for you because it applies to me and it applies to you 
personally. They're personal words. His grace is not just generally sufficient. His grace is sufficient for you and whatever you get hit with. See, do you doubt that? That his grace is enough to hold you up, to sustain you, to get you through. Do you think it falls a little short? At least in, in your particular case. Do you see what you're saying when you say that? It would be like a little fish swimming in the ocean and, and thinking, I, I might drink too much and it'll run dry. See, do you really think that you are badder than God is good? And I know badder isn't a word, but I, I like it here. Um, or that you have more problems or your problem is stronger or deeper then God has answers. See, if we believe that, we're going to flounder. But if we believe that, that this is true, when we get hit, no matter how hard we hit, his grace is sufficient, and his grace is made perfect or completed in our weakness, we're going to look for it. We're going to know. We're going to go into it with the confidence of, okay, this is going to be hard, but I can make it. And God's going to hold me in this because he promised. And we've got to ask for this grace. We, we've got to go after it. Paul's instructions in, to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.1, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. See, rely on that grace. Make it your source of strength. Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. So boldly claiming and, and walking in the things that God has promised us and believing I can be strong in this, in his strength. Sunscreen is, is a great way to ward off the rays of the sun. But see, we've got to put it on. We've got to apply it for it to work. And God's got this tube of grace in his word. And do we, do we apply it? Do we believe it? We've got to cover ourselves with it. And as the day goes on and the sun keeps shining, we, we've got to put it on again, apply it again. And then my strength is made perfect in weakness. God can't use people who think they are strong. You know why? Because people who think they are strong rely on their own strength, which is not spiritual strength, but fleshly strength. And, and we can go back and forth. My, my devotions this week have been about King Asan, and he did such a great thing, and, and when he was going to be attacked, he, he went to the Lord, and the Lord delivered him. And then, probably 30 years later, he was faced with being attacked again. And what did he do? He took money out of the, the temple of God, bought off another nation to make a treaty with him, and God said, you relied on the king of Syria instead of me. Well, what happens? I mean, you can go back and forth so quickly. We've got to be so careful when we make our decisions. Who am I relying on? Who am I looking to here? Those who know their weakness experience the strengthening of the Lord. Only weak people get this. He gives power to who? The weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. See, don't say, I can do this. Then God says, okay. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Paul had learned the truths of Christ's strength working in his weakness. He had learned the key to real victory in life. And so his prayer for the Ephesians was not that they be affliction free, but that they experience the truths of Christ's sufficiency. 
and strength as, as he had for them. This is his prayer for the Ephesians, that he would grant you, according to the rich of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Paul knew this. Paul had learned this. And what did he pray for others that he cared so much about? That he would know his strength, that you would be strengthened by him. Look at Paul's response to Jesus' answer to his prayer that his thorn would repart, depart, the last part of verse 9 and all of verse 10. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses. He knew them all for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Therefore, most gladly. Therefore, I will take pleasure. Pleasure. Not, therefore, I will accept this thorn. I'll, I'll bear this cross. No, Paul said, I will most gladly take pleasure. This word has a sense of how Paul would view his thorn. He would think good of it. Like when you take pleasure in a person, you think well of them. He would look to God's intentions in it. Paul wanted to know Jesus. That was his goal in life. And, and in this, he starts seeing, oh, God, you are working that goal in my life. When I'm weak, I know you better. And, and we all know that, right? In those hard times, don't we get to know the Lord better? And, and Paul was getting that. It's like, oh, you're accomplishing your goal, my goal in my life, in your ways, Lord. I've told you, Isaiah 26, 3, so many times, you will pe keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. God will keep in perfect peace the one whose purpose of life, the literal Hebrew, means God himself. See, what was Paul's purpose? That he might know him and bring glory to him. And when we get our purpose aligned with, with God's purpose, the result is peace. God working through weakness in a wonderful way so he could get the glory. Christ's strength was sufficient for his strength is made perfect, or as I said, uh, accomplishes its purpose in our weakness. First Corinthians 1, 26 to 31 says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Paul wrote this. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things which are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. I don't know if your leaders share this with you or not, but very often they come into leaders meeting feeling pretty weak, pretty inadequate, questioning why, why me? And I put up with this all the time with them. <laughs> But it's, it's fun to watch them come in that way and then see them after they have met with you. And they're like, wow, you know, God did it. God showed me this, you know. Because they know. They, they've seen God take them in their weakness and work wonderful things. See, if we're simply conscious of our insufficiencies, we are no, of no value. But when, we, when our insufficiencies move us to turn to and lay hold of the Lord's sufficiency, things happen. 
Paul was weak in his preaching. Yet look what the Lord did through that man. Look at the end of verse 9, that the power of Christ might rest upon me. This word rest means to fix a tent upon. And the idea is that the power of Christ rests on a suffering believer just as the Shekinah glory of the Lord rested in the holy place in the temple. See, his answer is the same to you and to me as it was to Paul. My grace is enough. For my strength is made perfect. My, my strength works the work that it needs to work in your weakness. Our part, keep on singing. Keep on praising his name. I have this little plaque on my nightstand. I don't think you can read it, but, but what it says is, when things go wrong, remember, the bird sings, not because he has the answer, but because he has a song. We have a song, don't we? We don't know why God does what he does or how, but we've got a song. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you. Lord, thank you for not leaving us alone in the hard times of this life. Thank you that you know how to wrap your arms around us and hold us. Thank you that you have got this whole situation with Clorinda. Thank you that in the same way you have got each one of our lives. Lord, may we not get in the way of what you want to do, but may we look for that sufficient grace. May we believe that your grace is enough. Oh, Lord, truly, when, we, when I say that, it is so much more than enough. It's abundant. And I praise you and thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. What was Paul's point? His grace is sufficient. His strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, and see, what is the therefore in your life and in my life because of that? And I think, you know, we all kind of default to what we're good at and Paul was strong. Paul was always a strong guy. And yet he's, he's saying to us, be weak and let God be strong. That's where he found the victory. I know that the Sunday morning after Clorinda had her aneurysm, we, we were at the hospital late, and I was talking to Amy before church and praying, and I I remember praying, Lord, give me that, that balance of vulnerability but strength. And I remember the minute I walked through the door, you know, the tears started going. And I said to the Lord, okay, you gave me the vulnerability. Now, now give me the strength. But see, I, I'm a pretty strong person. If I would have fallen back on my strength, what would you have said? Wow, Kathy's such a strong person. And you can tell fleshly strength, can't you? And you can tell... Godly strength. And, and so Paul was just saying, it's okay to be weak. Rely on God's strength and find the joy of letting his strength be sufficient in your life. Because that's what he found to be a key secret. So go enjoy your group and thank you for your patience for the length. God bless you.